Hey, here's day one of quarantine. See his eyes. Okay. I wasn't paying enough attention to him today. Here's day 57. There's actually, I think, some blood on there, and he wants it still. That's pretty good. I think it's crazy. He's had you enough. Know, there's he's there's nothing back. like starting a good show with some with some Harvey facts here and our and our classic and we're underway. That's that's our opening. Will, what do My you think? My best toss, that? but it was pretty good. That's pretty good. That's pretty entertaining, right? It's not bad. We we work hard on our entertainment factor here on the live show. Uh, Will, have you Robbins, ever been on a show that starts that way? What's that? Uh, uh, Will, have you ever been on a show that starts in a more miraculous way? Uh no, not not okay. to this date. But you know what I mean. There's there's always tomorrow. Got Gardner Minshew and Harvey. What a hey, day. Everybody. It's good to be here. Um, no, Will, uh, we're, we're excited to hang out with you. Um, we're going to dive into some course management today, which we haven't done yet on the live, on the live show here. So I'm excited to do that with you. We have a scorecard, um, from an anonymous golfer who we're not going to name, um, that we're going to look at and, uh, and talk a little course strategy. So I'm looking forward to it. Yes. Uh, for folks that don't know you, could you just give us a quick kind of background on kind of who you are, what you do, that kind of stuff? Yeah, absolutely. So Will Robbins, I'm a PGA professional up in uh, Sacramento, California. Uh, I've got uh, several golf schools up here in this area. And then the rest of my time is spent coaching golf coaches how to help players to get better results, how to get them to shoot lower scores, how to get them to get connected to their club and obviously get more enjoyment from this great game. So uh, helping helping to revolutionize golf instruction. An awesome. honest man's task. Appreciate it. Thanks. So we're talking course management. Where does your, what's your background in this? Or how did you come to become, you know, this coach and an expert in helping people kind of understanding where to hit the golf ball, what clubs to hit, where, like, where does this come from? Yeah. So initially it came from, I would say, caddying in college. So I came out to America on a golf scholarship and I caddied at Cypress Point under Jim Langley for a couple of years. And then when I graduated college in Florida, I moved back to California and did it for three more years. And so when I was caddying, it was just all this, always this mindset of like, how, how do I get the biggest tip? And you do that by making sure the person plays well. And so generally my caddying career was pretty much just a series of white lies. So it was helping people to realize that, you know what, you don't hit your 79150. So I would just say to them, like, look, it's, it's uphill. And they'd be like, it, it looks downhill. I'm like, yeah, but the air's thick. We're along the ocean here and it's cold. They're like, it's 83. I'm like, it's cold up there. So and then they would scab their five iron 151 and it would end up 10 feet. And I'm like, and they're like, oh, it's playing long. And I'd be like, yeah, yeah, it just plays long here. And so I just did that throughout the whole round. I uh, just would just go through the process of misreading putts for them because I knew that they pulled it. So I'd, I'd get them to double the break because I knew they didn't understand pace and I'd have them lag it. And inevitably, I just got very good at helping people to play to their potential. And also just the whole way down the fairway, just chatting with them, getting them relaxed. Oh, don't worry about that one. No worry about this. And just became a good caddy by being able to mentally coach. And I think I'll just tell one quick story, if you don't mind, is... The coaches out there were, and I'm sorry, the caddies out there who are dear friends of mine were very proud of every yardage marker. That's the 151 front edge. That's the 163. I knew no yardage markers. And I remember the day that I caddied for Ernie Els and Freddie Couples. And I thought this is going to be an interesting day because Ernie kept on asking me yardages. And I'm like, just, uh, okay, Ernie's going to hit it 207 if I say 207. And I remember on the 10th hole saying, Ernie, it's 205. He's like, you're wrong there, cuz. And I was like, no, it is 205. And he flew it over the green by 25 yards with a five iron. And he threw the club back to me and said, all right, you were right. And I was like, good guess. <laughs> so really my caddying career was very successful because I just helped people get the ball in the hole. You know, I want to take back the earlier comment about your honesty. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's you've got to do what's right for your players. You've got to give them what they need, not what they want. Okay. Hey, I, I appreciate that. Most of our the content that we make, uh, we do so much on Golf Channel, but a lot of the course strategy content we, we basically give is the not so subtle white lie of just aim uh, 15 yards left of the green, 10 yards long, and pray you hit your best shot ever. It'll be okay. Yeah. That sounds like you made a nice little living off that. Yeah, absolutely. I had a lot of fun with it. And uh, remember, Do you remember any positive stories from your Ernie Els, Fred Couples uh, caddy day? Um, 
Yeah, a couple stories of that. One would be that when Ernie said to me on the second tee, where do you want me to hit it, cuz? And I said, down the left edge of the fairway. And he said, no, cuz, where do you want me to hit it? And I said, oh, I want you to aim at that chimney. And uh, there was a member's house right out there. And I said, look, you aim at the chimney. And I just remember the ball going up the chimney. Now, the chimney was 700 yards away, right? But it was on the line and it went straight down the chimney. I mean, the chimney was no more than four feet wide. And I was like, oh, God. I'm like, this is not going to be a good day. And it just popped into my head that the eighth hole at Cypress Point is a dog leg right, which he can drive. And I have no idea where to aim. And every drive I told him for, for the next four holes, he hit exactly where he wanted. We play the par three, we get onto hole eight. He's like, where do you want me to hit it, cuz? And I'm like, oh, see that tree over there? You hit it right over there. He hits it right, never even left the line of what I told him. Never found his golf ball because <laughs> I had no idea where I was telling him to go. So it was just fun to see the level of how good they were. I think a story that, uh, I think, Cordy, I've told you this. I remember t telling one of the members, knowing that he was leading the club championship by two strokes, and on 18, he wanted to go through Hogan's Alley, which is a very tight set of cypress trees, and I gave him his putt up from 175 yards out, and I told him to putt it 20 yards across the fairway to me, wedged it onto the green, knocked his first putt six foot by, and luckily made it to win the club championship. So it was things like that where, you know, this gentleman was – a multi, multi, multi millionaire who was very, very successful and being the, the club championship at Cypress Point meant a lot to him and being able yeah. to be willing to tell him, here's your putter, sir. It, and he looked at me like, are you effing kidding me? And I'm like, no, because you go through there, we can make a 10. You go here, we're going to make a bogey. And so I think that's where, for me, I learned how to just take control of people's game. And I don't care who you are, or how much money you make. I care about you and I want you to shoot the lowest score. So this is how I'm going to get it in the hole for you. And you just got to trust me. How shortly after that were you fired? I never got fired. I, I was asked to leave. <laughs> I actually know I got um, about eight of the sponsors. They, uh, eight of the members sponsored me for, to go and play professionally for three years. So uh, you know, built a lot of great relationships there and um, just enjoyed it. It was an amazing, amazing opportunity. Yeah, I get the impression you were a good player. What, uh, how, how good were you? If you can be subjective about that. Um, yeah, I played played pretty well in college, and then I decided to stay amateur for a couple of years because I didn't feel like I was ready to go on tour. A lot of my friends sort of took the fifteen thousand dollars, and I'm going to give it three tournaments, and hopefully it goes well. And I kind of thought like that's not exactly a great business strategy. But fingers so, crossed, there. Yeah. So I, I worked. I, I I did score score. I did yardage books for a tour for the Spanos tour back in the day. So I got to learn the courses and I sold those and made some money and then did $150,000 worth of sponsorship for three years and then uh, turned professional, played one tournament, went on my honeymoon and pretty much never played tournament golf again. So yeah. uh, what was uh, what uh, what out of your game really kept you from, say, playing with Ernie Els or Fred Couples instead of Kerry? Um, I, I, I'll, I'll tell you this. I remember playing with Jeff Brejo, who played on the tour for quite some time. We got off a, a U.S. Open qualifier and he beat me by one. He went through and I didn't. And he said, Will. You're the best putter and best short game I've ever seen of any tour player I've ever played with. But I suggest that you take a year off and work on your full swing. <laughs> so I probably need to come to golf tech for a little bit of work because he's like, well, you just don't hit it good enough. I hit one green on the back nine at Bayonet and Black Horse and shot even par. And he's like, I don't know how you do what you do, but I was just a scramble. I was just a gritty golfer who could get the ball in the hole. But when I saw Ernie hit it, it was just like, goodness yeah. me i'm like that is just a whole day. i mean i hit the ball well i was a good golfer you know I mean? but then you just see freddie and ernie and you're like that's a just a completely different level of golf when you see someone who really owns it out there and they're very confident and, and they know sort of how it works it's yeah. uh, impressive to watch yeah uh where did you hit the balls i mean where, where were the bad ones where did I hit them? Yeah, you have driver problems. Was it? Uh... Um, I, yeah, I would just say that it's how I changed my coaching is, is that, you know, I went out to the States in my first two years in college. I never lost a golf ball, never hit a ball OB, never hit one into a hazard because I played a little cut. And then I was told you've got to hit a draw. And so then ah. I spent the next few years trying to hit a draw. And then I, instead of having just one miss, I had two misses and, and yeah, they were yeah. so far apart from each other. I so wish I had it was to... that easy where someone who was good, you could just tell them, well, now you need to just draw it. I won't tell you how it works or how to do it or what to do when you're uh, nervous about water on the left, but you should learn yeah. how to drive. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, I can tee a ball down low and hit a cut all day long and not even think about it, but it was like, no, no, you need to hit it further and need to do this. And so for me, that's part of how I coach is I just to teach people like, what is your go-to shot? If you don't yeah. have a shot that you can pull off when you can't feel your hands and you're sweating so hard and you're so nervous, you don't even know if the club's going to stay in your hands, yeah. then 
if I'm teeing it up and trying to launch one, it, it could go backwards, to be honest. Yeah, Whereas yeah that, that pattern is so important because uh, here's, here's some advice for someone who's sitting at home right now, uh, thinking about golf and can't wait to get back out there. Having some sort of pattern trumps the perfection of it. So you yeah. knew that you could play this pull cut that might have spun too much and went and launched too low, but it was predictable. And uh, the people who play golf, that's how they play well. You don't watch people on the 18th hole in tournaments um, that are going to start hopefully sometime this year. Uh, when you watch someone on 18 and the pressure's on, they're hitting the, the, the shot they're most confident in. They are not trying to now ultimately hit a shot that fits the hole just right. If yeah. Kenny Perry's out there playing real well in the Champions Tour, he's going to hit a push and a draw towards the hole. That's going to be Busy. So that's a a good lesson for everybody and it's awesome that's it's really what you're teaching people in the their most formulative stage of a golfer is here's your pattern i'll go play it and then we'll start adjusting it does that seem pretty fair yeah absolutely i mean i think just i think most people when they play golf they're frustrated and this is where it really came from because just as a background so i stopped playing tournament golf and i get out on the golf course or i get on the range i get given a job to start teaching and i'm staying on the range and these people are like i'm working on this and this and this and i'm like okay and what's it doing where's the ball going and they're like hey well, and i said can we just go and play a few holes of golf and and we get on the course and go and play and what i realized was is that my belief is most people don't have a technique problem at least if you're frustrated you don't have a technique problem you have a tension problem because if you had a tension, if you had a technique problem, you wouldn't be frustrated. You slice it in the lesson, you slice it on the practice range, you slice it before the round, you slice it in the round. But what tends to happen is you have a good lesson, you go to the range and hit it good, you go to the warm up, you hit it well, you go to the first tee and duck hook one OB. And you're like, I'm frustrated because I know I've got it, but it isn't coming over. Well, that's not technique, that's tension. And so my biggest belief really starting was like you said, how do I reduce the tension for them? So when I say, to them, look, just play a power slice from the left side. Who cares? I remember taking a, a pastor at a church locally here who was a 77 to 81 shooter out on the golf course. And for years, he'd been trying to hit a draw. And I said, look, just play it OB and slice it back in. And for nine holes, he just peeled it back in. It just went from a slice to a power fade. He went out the next week, shot 69. And he was just like, I can't believe it. I've been trying to fix something that didn't need to be fixed. I'm like, well, we all do that. You know, we all have good intention. But it's what what can you do to re release tension out of your game? And he was like, I could slice into the middle of the fairway all day long. I'm like, Bruce Litsky. <laughs> I'm like, why don't you just go and do that then? And so I think to me, that's the big thing is how do we manage tension when we play? It's not so much how do we manage technique. And if you can have a consistent pattern, whatever that looks like, mm -hmm. that gives you confidence. And that's what you've got to at least start to work with. And then like you said, Nick, build from there once you want to add shots to that repertoire. Yeah, the, the people that we teach will uh, mm. teach uh, all sorts of players, like from the best club players to the, a handful of PGA Tour players and web.com players. But mainly our business is the average guy who's not hitting good shots. So yeah. they come to us hitting those big pull fades, and you're giving them the advice to go play that, and then we'll start working on it. We're kind of saying the same thing. Uh, they come in from day one, and we try to reduce spin loft, close the face of the path, aim swing directions more into out, and, and that – makes a ball go farther yeah. while still teaching them here's how a pattern works here's how to minimize how much the ball curves uh, if you don't feel comfortable on the shot uh, here's how to play it here's where to aim the face where to swing yeah. so a lot of it is uh, very synonymous to what we're trying to do all the time we probably jump in quicker than you do into the technique variable just because that's what people want and yeah. our coaches are pretty good at <clears throat> what they do all day long is try to help people hit the ball straight yeah I like your style. Hey, Cordy. Yeah. I thought I saw a child's drawing earlier. Should we share that? Yeah, let's let's share that. I mean, okay. we've like um, to me. yeah, looked really good. It's very. Yeah, this, was a, uh, this is a an anonymous golfer sent us this. Mm -hmm. Um, sent us this to to review. Uh, it's from their first round of the year this last weekend, and their child doodled on it as they were driving along in the golf cart. Yeah. Um, feels very personal for being anonymous, but keep you going. Know, I got a lot of, I got a lot of details when they sent this in. I can tell um, not a Twitter post. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, I probably shouldn't have posted it on my Twitter saying it was me that kind of gave oh, it away, oops. but no, this is, this was my, this is my first round of golf back. And, um, obviously your first round of golf back, you, I, I tried to have super low expectations and just go out and we were with friends. We had kids out there. We had a great time. 
Um, but I kept track of my stats here with the scoring method, which was what Will has developed to kind of um, make course management really practical and simple. And so I thought we'd pull it up, got a bunch of questions on Twitter about it, um, and just kind of walk through what this all means. Cause somebody said, Hey, this looks really complicated. And I replied, you know, it actually makes things really simple and stress-free, which I was looking for, uh, the first round back. So Will, what, what are we looking at? Checks, X's, pluses, zeros. Um, what do we got? Yeah. So, um, this is the binary code to log into your Bitcoin, a Bitcoin account. <laughs> and so if you just their X's and ones, ones and zeros. I'll just put it this way. So often when I do goal schools with this, at the end of the day, I'll have people who, Nick, you teach a lot of, you know, been in the game for a long time, 65, 70 years old. And they'll say to me, why was I never taught this? Almost frustrated. Like I've been held back within nine holes of understanding this because it's so basic. It's so stupidly basic that it, it's not rocket science, but it works like rocket science because of how much it helps you to play your game. And I was saying to both of you earlier, before we got on the call here, a lot of pros, you know, even pros, and I would say amateurs even more, hindsight. Oh, I should have taken, I shouldn't have hit driver. I should have backed off of that one. I shouldn't have taken a seven iron. I should have taken a six, whatever it is. Well, it's, it's a waste of time. Who cares about, you know, hindsight? It's 2020, but it's at the end of the round, which builds your practice plan. As a golfer, you need to have foresight. You have got to start to know what to do before you hit the golf ball. And this is why when you're a caddy, you can help people not make really bad mistakes because you say to them, well, why don't we aim further left and a club along? And if you roast it, you're on the back left of the green and you putt. And if you miss hit it, you're 10 feet from the hole. But if you aim at the flag, you do that. So how do you teach someone very quickly how to do that? And so what we came up with was just a very simple concept that most people are taught the game of golf as a scratch golfer. This is what 72 is. It is a par. You're meant to be on this green in two shots and then have two putts and uh, enjoy yourself. And I'm like, well, that's the same as when I took up skiing saying, well, you're a guy. Here's a mountain. Go to the top. Find the one that has two black diamonds on it and just give it a shot. And that's where golf is so difficult because there's no way for us to learn how to play the game it's just we're compared to scratch always and so what we say is the first line is this idea of can you get into a scoring position can you get into a position to score and we don't want numbers we just want yes or no check or an x and so by taking the taking the hole and breaking it up into two parts and taking out the score and just going for yeses and nos checks and x's it allows you to reduce tension because what you do now is you have a task in front of you. This is a 400 yard par four. Can you not get to the green in two? Cause that's really difficult. Could you get with inside a hundred yards in two shots? And inevitably someone's like, of course I could hit seven, nine, seven, nine. Yes. Cause you're that confident. You could hit, I'm not telling you to hit seven, nine, seven, nine, but do whatever it takes to get to the hundred yard mark or beyond. And so it teaches you to, hey, driver's my favorite club, bomb driver, and then I've got, I, can, I can get to the green. Good for you. But on the worst day, what would happen? Well, I'd hook it out of bounds or I'd, I'd lose a ball. Well, how could you not hook it out of bounds? Well, I'll take my two hybrid. Great, hit your two hybrid and then a six iron. And you're inside the 100 every single time. Well, what you've done there is you've taken the blow up out of play. And so to me, what my job is to teach people, if you want to play better golf, take out big numbers. And so it really what this scorecard does is it puts you into a position to score without taking risk. Okay. And then if you can then get down in three, which is the second line, here's the next challenge. Can you get on the green and two putt? If you do that, the worst score you can make to par is a bogey. So you're one over par. Well, that's 90 for a round of golf, but inevitably most people make four or five pars in a round and maybe one birdie. And the next thing you know, they're using something that's so simple and they're shooting 81 and they were shooting 93 a week before I started working with them. And I've never touched technique. I haven't worked on their swing. All I've done is shown them how to caddy the way that I used to caddy for my players and give them a tool that the coach becomes their scorecard. And I'm there to just enjoy the, enjoy the day. So it's really about that simple. Can you get into a position to score? Yes or no. And then once you're in a position to score, were you able to get on, you know, down in three strokes? And if you did, you've taken out doubles, you've taken out blow up holes and that's the scoring method in its, in its simplest form. Yep. Looks good. And it looks like you're taking a par right out of the equation. Is that correct? Yeah. We're giving, we're giving the people the best opportunity to maybe make a par, but definitely not make a double bogey. Yeah. Okay. So do you want to go through the anonymous, uh, it's Gordy's, by the way. 
Oh, it's Cody Walker's. Wow. There you oh, go. I didn't say that. But Take yeah. two weeks off and give up for good night. <laughs> I, you want to go through like Cordy's uh, uh, first three holes here and we can you can judge him and I'll silently judge him while you do that? Yeah. So I would <clears throat> I would just say that, you know, if we took out the putts under four feet and the total putts, let's just not even bother with that right now. It's just that he got into the scoring zone on the first hole and got down in three. But he actually got down. I would imagine it was a par four. I don't know if it's a par if it's a par four, but I would imagine he got down in two. Right? But was it a par four the first hole? I was actually a par five. Um, oh, so you made birdie. So you got you got in the yeah. scoring zone and got down into you got down in, in two. So it's you made a birdie. Two. Great yep. stuff. Um, next hole got into the scoring zone and then didn't get down in didn't get down. In. What is it? A par five or a par four? This is a par four. Uh, hit it right. Um, no angle at the green. Had to chip out. Um, and then, so I got inside a hundred yards with the chip out there, but then to get down in three, um, hit it over the green because the pin was back and ran off. It had a runoff area, then chipped so it up. Stop, let's stop there. So again, yep. so first and foremost, he hit his shot right. So if I'm in a playing lesson with him or as he reviews around afterwards, uh, on the back of the scorecard, they're actually called the 10 rules of scoring. And which is like, well, the rules that you can't break. And so you were out of position, right? So basically you've, you've, you've got out of position so that's sort of like a ding that wasn't good but you got back in position inside 100 so now you're level one the only goal now is to get down in three but you said i had a back pin and you missed it long well you know you can't short side yourself right because if you miss it long on a back pin you have no shot so you play too aggressive that's another rule of breaking the scoring zone and then you didn't get up and down so you probably three putted so you broke five rules in one hole which is why you'd make a double bogey so if I'd have just told you, listen, as a caddy, listen, forget the back pin. Don't make par here. You're already one under on the first. Why don't we just go for the middle of the green, leave ourselves a 30-foot par putt. If we make it great, we tap and we make the bogey. How many times out of 10, if I'd have told you to do that, could you have done that, Cordy? Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I chose the wrong yardage to hit it to. I, I, well, I, you know, I honestly didn't use the laser right. I just hit the flag, didn't know it was even a back pin didn't you know there's there's a whole litany of things of just like when you're playing you just you start making silly choices which well you start making emotional choices you start to choose you oh i'm one under i want to do this i don't want to drop a shot yet your brain starts to go quicker instead of a caddy we just say to you listen your level scorecard one you are out of position let we got to avoid a double that's the only goal is to avoid a double because if you make a bogey we're still even who cares and you might make a par so the idea here would be is, is that, you know, you just played out of your comfort zone and that's what got you the X. But the, here's the beauty of the scorecard. Guess what? The next hole you stand on the tee box, you don't know if you want to over par or not. And this is where I would even say, sometimes I'll ask people not to go ahead and put in the total score and just put the checks and X's as we go and we can do the calculations afterwards. But hey, guess what? Next hole, par three, par four. What was that? What was the um... uh, next hole? Just a par four, just par four. So yeah. got into the scoring zone. So you have to reset. You see, what happens to people is they have blow-up holes because they let it compound. So you got out of position, then you hit it over the green, made a double, then you stand on the next tee, get aggressive, hit it in the trouble again, get frustrated, have a three-putt, make another double, and you have that three or four-hole stretch which just destroys your card instead of, no, can I just get a check mark? It's 200 yards. i got to go in two shots. I can hit four hybrid and then I can hit my wedge and be just short of the green. Great. Good for you. You might be able to make par on this hole. It's not saying that we want you to get to the 100. It's as long as you're past the 100. And so to me, as you were able to click right back in there and go ahead and get two checks, four checks, five, you, then you got checks. You didn't get another X for till the 13th hole. So you got back into your rhythm and got that round going. Um, so Will, what was the, what's the stat? I think this is one of the things that opened my eyes was uh, when Tiger lowered his scoring average whatever year it was that it was not, he made more birdies, but he made less bogeys. Right. Have you heard that yeah. stat? Nick Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I mean, Phil Mickelson is infamous for this. I mean, it was Phil Mickelson looking at being one of the, the number one birdie player on tour with no majors. And then he drops down out of the top 10 and he goes and wins majors. And so if you, and this is what I would say to all of the listeners is go at when the tour comes back on, or go back to golf stat on, on pghtour.com and go and look at the stats and see who had the least amount of three putts and the least amount of doubles. And then go and compare that to the top 10. And you'll see the person who wins the tournament is the person who's not making the bogeys. It's not the person who's making the birdies. And so to me, over 72 holes, you've only got to make, just think about it, 
15 birdies and you're going to win a lot of tournaments. But a lot of players are out there making 23 birdies and, and finishing 50th because they also made four doubles and a bunch of bogeys. And so it's, it really is about patience. This game is about being patient. But we jump ahead and get ahead of ourselves and play too aggressive. And because we don't have any, you know, no one telling us what to do. And that's what the scorecard is there to do is just get you back into the simplistic thing of get into a scoring zone and get down and get down from there. Mm -hmm. I really like what you said there, too, of uh, you're, you're subtly hinting at it more than I'm going to right now. Uh, aiming at the middle of the green, regardless of uh, what shot that is, how far your approach shot is for the average player, that is a better spot to be. Um, even for someone who's above average like Cordy, although did you have your range finder like upside down or were you looking at the wrong hole? What did you, you do? You know, I, I asked my two-year-old to get me the yardage and gotcha. I think he might have gotten it wrong. No, <laughs> I, I, I'm pretty sure it was you. I bet he did it right. But uh, aiming for the middle of the green will give you a safe spot to uh, then putt from. And that's what Tiger's probably most famous for suggesting when he was playing his best was how often he aimed just at the middle of the green. Well, Jack, uh, Jack Nicholas, I mean, didn't Jack say, Nick, that he never yeah. went for a flag stick? He always went for the middle of the green, and his belief was he'd have eight out of 18 putts that he'd have, he'd have six uphill, six downhill, and six tap ins, and it worked pretty well for him. Watching the 96 uh, Masters with Tiger on the, the last round, I don't think he aimed at a flag. Every single shot was right in the middle of the green. Long birdie putts that he, he too putted. He would have done very well on your, uh, your putting scorecard piece here and that's how you end up beating those guys so i think your yeah. point avoid double bogeys and try not to be too far out of position left or right obviously some technique will help you with that in the long run but if you needed to do something right now with no one helping you i think this is a awesome place to start yeah i was going to say nick with the technology that you guys have the beauty here is is bringing somebody in with their seven iron and go right let's hit 27 iron so let's see where they actually go. And once you realize you had 115 yards left and 120 yards short and 110 yards long and 117 yards right, your dispersion's massive. So then to go ahead and overlay that on a green, the only place you can aim is the middle because you've got one that goes 18 yards left, one that goes 12 yards short, one that goes 12 yards long, and one that goes 17 yards right. If you're aiming anywhere else but the middle, you're using a shot, you know, using a shotgun, hit the middle of the target and you're going to disperse it. And so I think using technology is such a great way to be able to give people perspective of there's no point in aiming for this flag stick. Take out a laser. Oh, it's a front pin. I'll take off 10. Well, you normally hit it bad anyway. Why not hit the your right yardage, miss hit it and hit it close rather than miss hit the one less club and end up short of the green where the trouble is. Usually hazards and bunkers are in the front of the green. I never see many course designers put them behind the green because they're not very pretty when you can't see a lane. You know? That is one thing I've seen, I've found interesting on, uh, uh, not to give away double super top secret stuff, but uh, that is one thing that game tracking I feel has been missing is actually telling you where to aim each one of your clubs. So I'm making a product now. I don't know if you're bugging my office or not, but we're going to use uh, uh, Foresight in a way that you just suggested. Come in and hit all of your golf clubs and we'll tell you where to aim. You could eventually do that with game tracking. So you'd have a caddy for you that way. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That'd be really cool. Awesome. But I love what you're doing here. Yeah. No, I, I think, um, and maybe just to explain a little deeper, Will, so people aren't saying like, so you say I hit a drive down the fairway and I'm 150 out. You're suggesting that I chip it 50 yards to get yeah, to 100 yeah. and then no. hit it in. No, get that's not past, the get concept. Get past the 100 yard marker. Do you know what I'm saying? So, I mean, what, without taking risk, because if you hit that 150 yard shot into a hazard, your third shot is now a penalty, which means you've got an X. So what it's saying is, and this is the one that I love, and Cordy, you know I have this video, because Will, will, many people say this to me, well, Will, Mark Sweeney, right, has told me, right, who I'm getting the right name, I'm thinking of every shot, every shot counts, right? Brody. Mark Brody. I'm thinking Very of Sweeney. Close. I this Sweeney's aim point, Mark Brody, Mark Brody. Mark Brody says every shot counts, so you have to go as far as further. I have a video of him at the Congress of Science thing up in Canada saying, no, 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 not at all. I'm working with the best players in the world. I'm telling the average golfer, go as far as you can without ever bringing in trouble. Yeah. So really the goal here is, is that, yes, I come out and you're hitting that slice driver and we just put it away and we hit the four hybrid. But then it's your goal to learn that first gear to get to the hundred but then it's also your pro's responsibility, your coach's responsibility to help you get the three wood in play so you can get to the 50. And then 
to get the driver, the skill sets with the driver in play so you can get to the fringe of the green. Because it's a lot easier to get down in three from the fringe than it is 100. And then level scorecard two, it's not down in three, it's down in two. So what you're saying is, let's find the base level. Let's find what you can score with, with this swing, with this game, with this skill set. You're shooting 97. I'll get you to probably 87, 89, round about that. I usually take a high 90 shooter, 10 shots off just from course management. But then the role is, now I need to make you better so that you can actually shoot 83 because that's going to come from actually you don't know how to really get out of a bunker or you slice your driver and you're losing 70 yards. I mean, you're leaving stuff on the table, but let's at least figure out where you are with the skills that you have. That's what we're going to focus on. Uh, you mentioned the different levels of scorecards. Can you talk about the progression a player might go through to get up to your yeah gear? Yeah, so we, we, we call it the gears of the game. So it's this idea that, you know, can you get to a hundred yards a tour player is trying to get to the green in regulation that's why they're pro so it's a hundred yards in in regulation one on a par three two on a par four three on a par five then level two is 50 then level three is 25 and then level four is the green in reg so you're always working to try and get there but at the end of the round i want a dispersion to look like this even for a tour player 18 times you're inside the scoring zone of 100 you're on the green 12 times, but six times you were chipping. Well, it's very easy to get up and down from a chip. That's why you shot 65. But if you hit 12 greens and six times you had three OB and two hazards and one 100, you shot an 82. Yeah. So it, it's always about that. D dispersion, dispersion has to go in this way. And then down in three at 100 actually becomes down in two, then down in two from 125, and then down in two from 150. So it gets further away from the hole in less shots and closer to the hole in, in less shots. And so it's basically meets in the middle and then that becomes your identity. So when you play your card, depending on your strengths, that's where you know you play to. But again, in a round of golf, even if you're scoring a level scorecard three, I play level scorecard three. If I duck hook one into the trees on the first hole, I'm instantly level scorecard one. Get back to the hundred yard marker. Don't try and get down in two, get down in three, take a bogey. At the end of the round, though, if you just bring up that scorecard, uh, Cordy, again, maybe just share the screen, it will then tell me the hindsight. It will give me my practice plan and say, you didn't get into the scoring zone. So for, oh, I was going to say your scorecard, uh, Cordy, maybe just to, just to show because you filled it out. You didn't get into the scoring zone twice. You should go to the range and work on that. And you didn't get down in, th down in three, three times, go and work on that. So my, you can see down the bottom here, Cordy, if you, there's 15 times I was in a position to score, three times I didn't score. 16 times I got down in two, twice that I didn't. So it builds you a practice plan because I see a lot of golfers at the end of a, a round, oh, my drive is terrible. You had 41 putts and you're going to tell me your driver was terrible. I'm like, you, okay, you, you hit it OB on 18 and it upset you, but your drive is not the problem. You didn't get down in three, 14 times in a round of golf. And then we need to go on the golf course. And what we do is we play games on the course, something like perfect drive. This is a great game to play. You take a person out for nine holes and they tee off. Wherever they hit it, you pick the ball up and you drop it at the 100-yard marker and say, look, you just hit the best drive you ever hit, 270 yards down the middle. Next hole, they hit it into a bunker, pick it up, go and drop it at 70 yards. You just right where their best drive and 20 yards beyond their best drive, and then you have them score. And if they normally shoot 47, they'll shoot 46, maybe a 45. And I tell them, I could make you the best drive of the ball in the world. Take me about three years, and I'll shoot about 20 grand. And it may not happen. And you're going to save two strokes or I could go ahead and teach you how to chip and putt and I can save you 10 shots guaranteed in the next 10 weeks. So it's, it's, it's those things that they have those aha moments. That they go, Oh my goodness, this is where I'm leaving my game. This is what the scoring method is teaching me. This is so simple. And then all they've got to go out and do is execute checks and X's. And, and that's what makes it a very simple system that they can't tell me stories. Well, you'll never guess what happened on this hole. Uh, yeah. you got a check and an X. That's it. You know what I mean? Like, we don't need to go under. I like the simplicity you're taking to this. I do feel like game dragon right now is way too complicated. It can be this simple or maybe even simpler for most golfers, and they get a high level of efficacy out of it. I kind of feel like the person who's anonymously given us their scorecard should remain on level one for a while. Your thoughts? Yeah. And I mean, to me, I remain my players on level one like for a long, long time because what inevitably happens is that they go to level two. And then they go, I got to hit it further. I got to try harder. The tension goes up, the driver comes out and now they lose three golf balls and then they've lost it. So what we really then do is say, look, on the round today, put the holes in here, right on the round where you're going to hit driver, where you're going to hit hybrid. 
And I'm okay with you hitting driver, driver on six because it's a wide open part five and nine, but I'm not okay with you hitting it on seven. So we then start to help them understand the strategy of what gear will you play off the tee box? Are you going to fourth gear it and hit driver and try and get in play? Or are you going to use your trusty six iron that only goes 160, but this hole is a, it's the hole you triple every time. And so then they just, they get an identity for how they play their course. And then we see the highlights of like, what did you do well? What did you not do well? And what do we need to work on? So it, there's not a lot of guessing when we're coaching, you know, it's not like, what should I work on? It's like, well, I don't know. It's right here in front of you. It's telling you exactly what you need to do. And as a coach, you know, we, we train our students how to use the system so they become their own coach. Yeah. And to Cordy's point early on starting, this is not making things complicated. This is making things simple. Like, oh, ooh, yeah. Simple. So I applaud you for the work that you've done here too. Know that I'm interested in uh, in the same sort of approach. We just have to move a little slower than what, what you're able to do. But uh, I'm all on board for our students and coaches really being masters of a system similar to yours. Have you... Uh, um, uh, have you dabbled a little bit on some of the other popular uh, scoring systems? So uh, my friend Scott Fawcett has, has been great. He's been super uh, polite, yeah. and we're trying to always work out something that you know I might be able to collaborate on. And uh, my friends at Lowest Score Wins, David Wedzik and Eric Barjeski, uh, both yeah. of those guys are great. Have you dabbled at all in what they do? Yeah, yeah I love it. And Arcos and Game Golf, I love all of it. I just think, for example, 10, 12, 2008, I built out, I spent several hundred thousand dollars on building out a whole program that tracked all of this and did everything. And uh, what I found was nobody used it. And yes. People used it or they got confused by it and they're on the course trying to do their phone and then what I realized is every one of us has a scorecard in our hand and every one of us fills it out at the end of a hole and every one of us knows what a check and an X is and just realize that, you know what, yes, we built out an app and it was, you know, but to me, it's like, this is what golfers do. And then the beauty is as a coach, they hand me a scorecard and we build a practice plan. Then they get a practice plan. They come back the next week with their improvement plan. And did you do what we had to work on? And it's just for us, it's, we've just really found that, um, I think people love, you know, birdie fire and all these decades stuff is, is phenomenal, you know, and, and for elite golfers. Yeah. You know, if you love those stats and those numbers, that's great. But if you're someone who's like, I don't want to track all that stuff and I'm confused, just want something that I can help me to play better golf. That's why we've sort of stayed with the physical scorecard because it's just, you know, Oh yeah, look at that. And then when you look at the scorecard and you see X, 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 it's like, you might be playing a slightly too aggressive right now. That's not good. It's, no, I, I like that. I think uh, I would like to do this both ways, quite honestly. Trying to not tap into what we're looking to continue to do, but I, I really like the simple approach because people don't want to carry their phone around and enter data in around or make sure that what they did on the previous hole was correct and go back and fix that on the next tee. It's got to be simpler than that. And what you're doing here is really cool. Well, I think what you're saying, Nick, with the, with the technology that you guys are developing and stuff, I mean, down the road, I think a younger generation will absolutely be happy to do that because yeah. they're just, they've grown up with a phone in their hand. Whereas the, the people I coach, you know, probably 40 plus of age, they're just very much more used to a scorecard. And, and then I think the tech play golf and not yeah. be distracted by their exactly. Golf and, golf. Then, and that's why it's so simple for them to fill it out. And then the ones who are super, if you want to bring mine up, Scotty, if they are super savvy and they really love the tech side of stuff and they love data, which I, I mean, I love being able to coach them and say like, yeah, this is exactly the way you need to work. This is my scorecard. So this is more of, you know, just how, how you'd fill it out a little bit more advanced. And so for example, on the first hole, I had 120 yards into the green and I hit the green regulation. So when on the first, um, on the first hole, you see a check mark. That means I hit the green on the second hole. I was within 25 yards of the flag. So I was chipping the next hole. I hit the green because there's a check mark mm -hmm. next hole. To me. And you'll see on the eighth hole, I got it within 50 yards, but you'll see throughout the whole round. I was never outside of the scoring zone. I never got outside of a hundred. So that's 18 of 18 inside the scoring zone. Good for will 16, 17 of 18 inside of 50 good for will and then one two three four five six seven eight and then 10 greens in regulation but the other seven were chipping and that's why it's not hard to go ahead and get up and down in two a lot so i'll track how far i was from the hole and did i hit the green and then how long was my first putt because the beauty is, is if i track my first putt so in the second line It'll say I got down in two on the first hole. I got down in three on the second hole, got down in three on the third hole. You see the bottom side of that triangle. But at the top, I'm talking about my proximity of my first putt. So now I know, Will, on the second hole, 
you were within 25 yards and you chipped it to 20 feet. What on earth happened? Were you short-sighted or was it a terrible chip? Then I can look on the, on the next hole, I was 25 yards away and I hit it to 18 feet. Okay, well, this is not trending very well that you're chipping the ball to outside of 20 feet. You should be inside of six feet from this distance. So as a coach, I can very quickly ask someone, what, what's going on there? Yeah. Oh, I did this, or I did that. So you can dive into a lot more data uh, and pull that information so then I can build out a practice plan for them and start to show them what they need to work on in more detail for the coaches. For the, And I've got players that shoot 91 that love doing this in 87. And I've also got sure. players that shoot 73 that don't like doing it. And I'm like, if it's going to take you out of your state and it's not going to put you in the great place, just go to the basic checks and Xs. Because um, a lot of good players can just remember their rounds afterwards and, and enter the data. That is crazy. I have a few friends who can remember every shot they hit from 15 years ago, but those are, I need better friends. Uh, it does appear, however, that you are a significantly better player than the anonymous scorecard that we saw before. Is yeah, that yeah, I say. Misspent youth. Yeah, I hear you. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, this, this has been goodwill. I think for my scorecard, what I learned is I need to go increase my club head speed. So, um, yeah. I'm going to go work on that because that's what I took from that. I think I got that right. Um, is that right, Nick? Did, did, I, did, I get this, did I get this session? It's almost like you didn't pay attention, but sure. <laughs> no, Will, it's been super fun. Um, I, I enjoy doing this because anytime you have a plan of what you're going to do when, it helps lower your stress. So if I know that I can make a bogey on every hole without having to think about it, it really helps me. Um, and it just lowers that tension level. So super good stuff. I always enjoy chatting this with you. Thanks for taking the time to come. Yeah, great, great, great to be on. Much enjoyed it. Much sharing. Much enjoyed sharing. Awesome. Well, Nick, we'll be back tomorrow. Ooh, what are we doing tomorrow? Tease. We are talking with Dr. Paul Wood of the Ping Golf Club Company. Oh, nice. I want to talk to Paul about some stuff we haven't talked about which is all about center of gravity and MOI. And uh, I want to pick his brain on how, or I've got an idea for the ultimate slice reducing golf club. And I want to see if he laughs at me or not. I, I, I'm going to predict that he does. Oh no, this is going to be amazing. Yeah, you don't want to do this. I'm telling you what I'm going to throw at him. He's never heard before. Will, are you convinced? Are you going to tune in tomorrow? Is that a good teaser? Are you, are you sold? <laughs> I, I, I am a diehard MOI guy, big time, big time. As you can tell, big, big number stat guy, uh, you know, oh, data. Oh, love it. <laughs> all right. We are over and out. We'll see you all tomorrow, 2 Eastern, Thursday. Will, thanks for hanging out. Appreciate it. Hey, thanks for being on.